Monday Night Raw, Friday Night SmackDown, WWE Ash Figure Setup Style, let's go! Welcome everybody to the Week in Review, episode 261. We're going to be starting off talking about Monday Night Raw from Ohio, O-H-I-O. Halfway through the video, we're going to be jumping into SmackDown. This episode of Raw was freaking banging. Last week's episode, I did a separate video from SmackDown. It wasn't the Week in Review. This week, it's the Week in Review, baby. SmackDown, Raw, same video. We're starting off with the red brand. Let's go. Go! We have another show with Drew McIntyre and Damian Priest, the two men that will be going at it at the Clash of the Castle for the World Heavyweight Championship. How do I think that match will end? CM Punk screws Drew. It's only a matter of time. They haven't been mentioning CM Punk too much on WWE television, unless you talk about NXT Battleground. Dude, it's only a matter of time till Punk screws Drew in his home freaking country. Oh god, it's gonna be brutal. Drew's gonna literally kill Punk. Anyways, this promo was amazing. Damian Priest said, you know what? You you fight Finn Balor tonight. If you beat Finn Balor, no Judgment Day on ringside this Saturday for our match. But if you lose, Judgment Day can be on ringside. So that was our main event of the show is Finn Balor versus Drew McIntyre. We'll talk about that soon. As you guys know, I like to go in order with the week in review how everything actually happened on the show. But yeah, this was a pretty solid promo to get started. I love Drew McIntyre. He's like my favorite WWE superstar on Monday Night Raw right now, like literally. And this promo with Damian Priest, top tier. Can Priest talk? Still, he's still needs to work on his promos, no doubt about it, but this is pretty good, setting up for our main event. Liv Morgan entered the Judgment Day's locker room and left Dominic Mysterio with her hotel key. How interesting is that? And then told him that she wants to call him daddy, I guess? And that he should not be calling Rhea mommy, so that's very, very interesting. Dom slammed the hotel key on the table, he's like, I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want it, but then later in the show, the hotel key disappeared, and Judgment Day doesn't know where it went. So I think Dominic has it in his pocket, and next week, he is going to enter Liv's hotel room. My God, dude, it's getting interesting. It should have been me, though. Lyra Valkyria went one-on-one -on -one with EO Sky. I, yes, I am using Beth Phoenix. I don't know why. I, I don't have a Lyra Valkyria. They haven't made a Lyra Valkyria, so I'm just using Beth. She went up against the new EO Sky, who's been very aggressive lately on WWE television, and I don't even think the rest of Damage Control approves of this new aggression. Damage Control did get involved in this match leading to Lyra Valkyria. Basically a three-on-one. So Lyra Valkyria loses. Eosky picks up the victory and then goes in for a beatdown after the match. And even, even Damage Control is like, dude, what are you doing? Like, why? We already won. Let's get out of here. Like, you could just see it on, like, Dakota's face and Kyrie saying, they're like, Eosky, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? So it was like a full beatdown. Then Katana Chance and Caden Carter came out. I have a brand new Katana Chance figure right there. I just need Caden Carter, but there's Katana Chance. So she came came out and she's like nah this ain't happening so she backed up Lyra Valkyria probably gonna lead to a six woman tag team match next week if I had to guess but yeah this new EO Sky is pretty pretty psychotic even backstage she got pretty crazy it was a crazy six man tag team match with Rey Mysterio Dragon Lee yes that is Kalisto I don't have a Dragon Lee yet and Braun Strowman, who wouldn't get tagged in until the freaking end of the match. They went up against Dominic Mysterio, JD McDonough, and Carlito of the Judgment Day. The Judgment Day basically dominated the entire match up until Braun Strowman being tagged in. Once Braun Strowman got tagged in, he freaking freight trained around the ring, took out absolutely everybody, and then freaking double teamed with Dragon Lee on top of his shoulders to Carlito to pick up the victory. Pretty cool to see Dragon Lee pin Carlito, the man that screwed him over a couple weeks back, so that's pretty cool. Braun Strowman, all they had to do was tag him in, and then they finally did, and then the match come to a conclusion, but during the match, obviously we saw Liv Morgan land on Dominic Mysterio, which was very, very interesting. <laughs> so it was getting a little uh, getting a little crazy on ringside, and then uh, Selena Vega broke it up. She's like, nah, Liv, this ain't happening. She was trying to back up her team, and then started attacking Liv. I'm like, nah, Selena, let this go down. What are you doing? <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it, it was pretty wild. I love the Liv and Dom. 
Dom stuff. I think it's so interesting. But when Rhea comes back, my God, dude, my God, Rhea's gonna be so pissed off with Dom. Like, isn't she? I don't know. I feel like Rhea and Dom's relationship is more of like a, yeah, she's like my mom. and She's not my girlfriend. Like, she's my mom straight up. So I don't know, like, because Liv's trying to make it like a girlfriend-boyfriend relationship. Like, I don't know, man. This is interesting. Is this Otis stuff getting old? It's very well possible. It was Sami Zayn going one-on-one -on -one with Otis. And I'll be honest with you, Otis, he was dominating this match. He had this victory in the bag until Chad Gable jumped on the apron and decided to start distracting Otis. Led to Otis getting Halula kicked. Sami Zayn picks up the victory. And then after the match, Sami Zayn still gets taken out, man. Which was so annoying to see. Chad Gable just kept manipulating Otis. And then it looked like Otis was going to hit Gable at a point. Then he didn't. He attacked Sami Zayn even more. World Strongest Slam leaves Sami Zayn laid out in the center of the ring. I'm like, bro, just hit Chad Gable already. Okay, my prediction for this. Otis, the only thing that will set him off to where he turns on Chad Gable is if Chad Gable puts his hands on Maxine Dupree, I guarantee it. At the Clash of the Castle, when Sammy faces Chad for the IC title, Chad Gable will literally, like, somehow put his hands on Maxine Dupree, like, push her down or something, and that will set Otis off. That'll be the only thing. That seems to be the only thing that really pisses off Otis is when somebody messes with his sister, Maxine Dupree. We'll see what happens. But as far as this, I don't know. It's just, it feels like the same thing we've been seeing. Like, I like this story, but it just feels like the same thing we've been seeing on the past Men and I Raws here. Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark looks pretty strong. When they went up against Alba Fire and Isla Dawn in tag team action, on ringside we did have Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair, the current women's tag team champions. They wanted an up-close look at this match, and they got it because it was a pretty good tag team match. In the end, I was very shocked to see Shayna Baszler freaking pass out Alba Fire. I was like, that is awesome, dude. Way to put, may, way to make Shayna Baszler look bad even after her loss at NXT Battleground. It felt good to see Shayna pick up the victory for her team, her and Zoe. So they stare down Jade and uh, Bianca, and then I guess a triple threat tag team match was made for Clash of the Castle. It's going to be Bianca and Jade versus Zoe and uh, Shayna and then the Unholy Union, Alba Fire and Isla Dawn. Ought to be a good tag team match, but you already know Jade and Bianca are going to come out on top. But this stuff is pretty good, though. I like Shayna a lot. I really do. I know not a lot of people do, but I like Shayna. Dude, this was so hard to watch. First of all, Braun Breaker went one-on-one -on -one with Ilya Dragunov. One-on-one -on -one action. This was a great match. Very hard hitting by the announce desk. Ilya Dragunov literally got dropped right in his midsection on the corner of the desk. And I was like, God, that's freaking just excruciating. And then Braun Breaker finishes it off with a spear. Look to do more damage, like literally spear him through the barricade, but luckily Ricochet was there so then no more damage could be done to Ilya Dragunov. But then later backstage while Ricochet was helping Dragunov to medical, Ricochet actually got medical because Ricochet was attacked by this insane, psychotic psychopath Braun Breaker who sent Ricochet's head first into a semi-truck and then Ricochet's head literally bounces off cement. Like, yeah, I know this stuff is like... Okay, I hate to use the word... I would never use the word fake, but like scripted. But like, dude, Ricochet's face literally bounced off cement. Like, oh my god. I know he's not re-signing with WWE soon, but dude, no need to drop the dude's face on freaking cement. This was like uncalled for by Braun Breaker. And then after that, he climbed up steps and then freaking sent him through the windshield of a damn car. Like, bro... Are you insane? Ricochet, like, actually, I swear to you, probably needed medical attention after this fight um, in, in the bag. It wasn't even a fight. It was just a freaking humiliation, honestly. It really was. Samantha Irvin even run, ran to the back to uh, comfort Ricochet. He was, he was loaded in an ambulance. But this was intense. This was insane. Braun Breaker is, like, an absolute beast. Like, oh, my God. And I, like, low-key felt bad for Ricochet, dude. God almighty. Like, this is... It, it, it was uncalled for. It really was. Like, bro... Ah, oh, dude, this was insane, though. This was a crazy beatdown. No Adam Pierce either. No Adam Pierce here to calm down Braun Breaker or threaten him with fines. I guess Adam Pierce wasn't being... He wasn't at the show. I guess he just had this Monday Night Raw off, so he wasn't there to calm down Breaker, which was freaking stupid. Awesome Truth had to defend their tag team championships up against AOP, and I'm like, how in the hell is, is Awesome Truth going to come out on top here? Because I'm like, I know they're not losing their tag titles, but how are they going to retain here against these two behemoths, Ankum and Re Bizarre of Authors of Pain. Uh, the solution? New Day. New Day, who have been beefing with the Final Testament because I guess Karrion Cross wants to recruit Xavier Woods to his group, but that didn't really work out. Their music hit. They distracted AOP, led to Awesome Truth uh, picking up the victory with a little roll-up retaining their titles. I was like, bro, that's insane. Our truth and Miz only ever win when somebody distracts their opponent. I swear. Like, the second somebody doesn't distract their opponent, they will literally lose those tag team championships. I like them a lot, though. I really like Awesome Truth. I think, I think they're fun. But 
I still think this does lead to the split of New Day. I think Xavier Woods will eventually join the Final Testament. Uh, maybe they like hypnotize him or something. I don't know. You know how weird Karrion Cross is, so you never know what will happen there. But I like the awesome truth. This wasn't bad. wasn't my favorite part of the show, though. And our main event of the show, where Finn Balor went one-on-one -on -one with Drew McIntyre. Will the Judgment Day be barred from ringside at the Clash at the Castle? The answer is yes! Drew McIntyre shockingly won this match. I thought for sure we were going to saw the Judgment Day get involved, which they tried to. JD and Carlito tried to do a little distraction on Drew. And that does that prove that Damian Priest is afraid to face Drew? He needed to try to distract Drew in this match so then Finn will win and Judgment Day's not barred from ringside. But no. Not the case. Drew hits the Claymore, stares down Drew McIntyre as he pins Finn Balor, which I loved. I thought that was so good. And then they go face to face as the show ends. I am so freaking excited for their match at the Class of the Castle. Like, literally, it's going to be so good. But like I said, I guarantee it. CM Punk screws Drew. CM Punk screws Drew. And CM Punk, I swear, is going to be a heel after that because I feel like Drew's more of a face right now. So I feel like Punk's going to be the heel in that storyline. Dude, I don't know. We'll We'll see, but ain't no way Damian Priest is losing that world title at the Clash of the Castle. Prediction video uh, already on the channel, so if you guys are interested in checking it out, please do. Uh, but yes, that was Monday Night Raw. Great Monday Night Raw in the end. There was some weak stuff, but there was also some really good stuff. That's why I'm ranking this Monday Night Raw a 8 out of 10. I thought it was a great show. My favorite moment slash match, it wasn't even really a match. It was a beatdown. Uh, Ricochet being assaulted backstage was easily my favorite moment. Props to Ricochet for taking insane bumps there with Braun Breaker. My god, it was insane. Uh, was So was this entire Monday Night Raw. Uh, but we're going to jump into the blue brand right now. We're going to jump into SmackDown. We're going to talk about it. We're going to go in-depth on it. But yeah, what a crazy Raw. My god, insane Raw, dude. And jumping into the blue brand, we're going to be talking about SmackDown from Glasgow, Scotland. We got a little sneak peek of what we're going to be seeing later today at the Clash of the Castle. Same arena, same spot. So SmackDown, freaking solid show. We're going to talk about the entire thing just like we do in Monday Night Raw, starting with our opening contest. It was Naomi going one-on-one -on -one with Chelsea Green. This match, believe it or not, was actually pretty decent for the opening match. In the end, we did see Chelsea Green nearly escape with the victory by trying to cheat by putting her legs on the ropes for leverage, but Bailey's like, nah, that ain't gonna happen. Bailey and Piper were on ringside, so Bailey's like, no, that ain't happening. She pushes her feet off the ropes. Piper and Bailey start getting into it on ringside. No physical brawl here, but they just got into it. Face-to-face -face confrontation. It led to Naomi. Naomi taking advantage, hitting a little pinning combination on Chelsea Green to pick up the victory over Chelsea. So Naomi beats Chelsea, and then they think it's all well and good because they're walking around backstage, kind of celebrating, and then here comes Piper and Chelsea again, who absolutely annihilate Bailey and Naomi backstage after the victory. I mean, I could understand why Piper and Chelsea are pissed off. In a way, Chelsea had the victory. She had Naomi pinned for three. If it wasn't for Bailey pushing her legs off the rope. But as far as the opening contest, pretty good. Their match at the Clash of the Castle, I mean, I guarantee Bailey wins, but it ought to be pretty decent. Normally, I cannot stand the Grayson Waller effect, but I was looking forward to this episode because I'm like, I hope they revolve the story and the show itself about the controversy between Austin Theory and Grayson Waller, and they did. Their special guests were DIY. Johnny Gargano especially tried to drive a wedge between Theory and Waller, and he did because he knows Theory very well. Do you guys remember the way in NXT? Yeah, me neither, but he knows Theory really well, and so he just starts talking to him, and he's like, you know, he's holding you back. He's holding you back, but I mean, in a way, that's kind of inaccurate because they are tag team champions, so how could he be holding him back? But I understand where he's going with this. He keeps pulling him in harm's way, which they showed video of proof of that. And Grace Smaller even pulled Theory in front of a knee from Tommaso Ciampa. But first, Theory did take a hit for uh, Grace and Waller. I guess it's a little half and half. Theory does trust Waller a lot, but in a way, he is starting to not trust him more and more. I would love to see a face Theory. I say it every week, and I would love to see new tag team champions. Give it to DIY. They deserve it, dude. Like, in my opinion, Waller and Theory are just placeholder champions until Theory turns face. I can't wait till Theory turns face. It's gonna be awesome. Paulo Cruz looked for a little revenge when he went up against Santos Escobar. If you guys remember last week, Angel and the rest of uh, Legado de Fantasma attacked him backstage, so he wasn't able to have his matchup against Angel. He got even a better opponent this week, that being Santos, and then it led to freaking Baron Corbin making his presence felt because the rest of Legado was trying to get involved in this match, so Baron Corbin burned 
the ships. He came out. He took out Humberto. Took out Angel. But he wasn't able to take out Electra Lopez. And Electra Lopez cheated for Santos by pushing Apollo off the top rope. Led to Santos rolling up Apollo Crews and picking up the victory. And I'm so glad Corbin didn't really associate himself with Apollo. Like, he didn't comfort him in the ring, which I liked. Corbin kept to himself. He stayed on the outside of the ring. And I guarantee you he's going to be facing Santos next. Which I'm really excited about. Because I love Barrett Corbin's new thing. Burn the ships. Uh, I respect those who respect me. Like, dude, or loyal to me. Who's loyal to me? I'm loyal to them. Like, dude, this is awesome. I love the new Corbin. Uh, but as far as Apollo, ah, dude. I mean, he's talented, no doubt about it, but I've never been a big Apollo fan. He just, he loses every time. I mean, it's just not, it's not entertaining. I'm sorry. But dude, Corbin, destroy Santos, please. Cody Rhodes and AJ Styles went face to face, and yes, I finally have the undisputed WWE Championship right there, so I could put it with Cody Rhodes. He looks fully complete now, which is amazing. Got that with the new Elite 110. Roman Reigns from Ringside Collectibles, WrestlingFigures.com. Review on the channel. Anyways, him and AJ Styles went face to face at first. I thought AJ Styles was going to bring the club out, and it was going to be a three-on-one beatdown, but he sent the club to the back. By the way, Luke Gallows looked like a complete badass, dude. I'll just say that, dude. He looked awesome. So Styles goes face to face with Cody, calls him a quit you're a quitter. You've quit everything you've ever done, including, he referenced AEW, but he didn't say it, uh, Ring of Honor, New Japan Pro Wrestling. You've quit everything, even WWE. You've quit everything. So how easy is it going to be to have you say, I quit? And then Cody Rhodes had some valid points towards AJ Styles. It's going to be a hell of a match in all. I cannot wait for their I quit match. It's going to be so freaking good, dude. I know AJ Styles is going to say those words, I quit, but it's a matter of how Cody is going to get him to say those words, I quit. Like, literally, you got to think the club's going to be there. Oh, there's going to be some close calls with Cody, but ain't no way Cody's saying I quit. There's no freaking way. But I love this promo though. Meechin had an opportunity to take out the queen of the ring, Nia Jax. They went one-on-one. -on -one. Tiffany Stratton was on ringside, and she got into it with Meechin because Tiffany Stratton, I, yeah, I know that's some array, but I don't have a Tiffany Stratton yet. I'm waiting on her elite. I don't want to do basic. It sucks. Uh, but Tiffany Stratton sent some water or some sort of liquid in the face of Meechin, and then it led to Nia Jax taking out both women, and then Nia Jax kind of just hit the annihilator on Meechin to pick up the victory. Kind of a filler match. Nothing really crazy here. But hey, I guess Queen of the Ring still has some momentum here. Logan Paul and LA Knight weren't physically at this show in Glasgow, but LA Knight pulled up to Logan Paul's house and when, was in his pool. How crazy is that? He was literally on a floaty tube in his pool as Logan, Logan Paul got back home from his Tetris competition. I was like, what on earth is going on here? LA Knight infiltrates Logan Paul's house and he wants a United States Championship opportunity. If Logan Paul isn't going to come to the shows, he's going to come to Logan Paul. How interesting. Shows up in his freaking pool. <laughs> Carmelo Hayes had a little promo in the crowd with the WWE Universe talking about he is all in for Mr. Money in the Bank. He has a qualifiers match coming up and he wants to be Mr. Money in the Bank. Will we see Mr. Him in the Bank? <laughs> Elba Fire and Isla Dawn also had an interview with Jackie Redman on the stage talking about how they want those tag team championships and they're going to do everything they can to get them around their waist at the Clash of the Castle. Not a bad little uh, interview there. They're from Scotland, I guess, so they had the crowd behind them. And it was our main event of the show. It was Kevin Owens going one-on-one -on -one with Solo Sokoa and the bloodline was barred from ringside by Nick Aldis. But I guess the bloodline doesn't mean Paul Heyman? Isn't Paul Heyman a part of the bloodline? How wasn't he barred from ringside? That doesn't make sense to me. But anyways, uh, Solo Sokoa said, if I I lose tonight, I come after you, Paul Heyman. So Paul Heyman had to do any means necessary to make Solo win, which he did. He pulled Solo's foot on the rope, literally when Kevin Owens had the victory. And there were no Street Profits, because they got taken out earlier in the show, so they weren't able to back out Kevin Owens. They weren't able to help him out. So Kevin Owens had to go with Solo, if you know what I'm saying. Solo Sokoa. <laughs> so Solo, Solo was able to pick up the victory after Kevin Owens was getting into it with Paul Heyman. He was pissed with Paul Heyman, but Paul Heyman had to do it, otherwise Solo was going to take him out. So Solo Sokoa picks of the victory, pins Kevin Owens, and then after the match, you already know the bloodline's gonna infiltrate the ring, but I was expecting the Street Profits again, but we saw the Viper Randy Orton make his little return here on SmackDown, comes out, he RKO's Tonga Loa, and then Solo Sokoa sort of escapes uh, Randy Orton, but he did eat a Hangman's DDT, which was pretty cool, and Tamatanga ate the freaking barricade to the spine, which was insane. Great way to end the show, seeing a little return here for Randy Orton was awesome. It's always awesome seeing a Randy Orton pop, uh, 
and him helping out Kevin Owens. RKO is back, if you know what I'm saying. Great way to end the show. But that was SmackDown in a setup style from Glasgow, Scotland. Crowd was hot. Show was hot. I cannot wait for Clash of the Castle. I will be fully reviewing the Clash of the Castle show happening today. I will be reviewing it tomorrow on the Better Love YouTube channel, so stay tuned for that. And my absolute favorite moment here on this episode of SmackDown had to have been the return of Randy Orton. How could it not have been? And I'm not going to lie. This Logan Paul LA Knight segment had me laughing. I thought that was really goofy. I did enjoy it. If I had to rate this show out of 10, I'd give it a solid 7 out of 10. I thought it was an absolutely jam-packed episode of SmackDown. Can't wait for Clash of the Castle. I know you guys can't wait. This is Brett Alive, signing out.